Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th edition, while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over their origins within the game, how they're utilized in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This week, we'll be covering the dragon-adjacent, low-level ankle biters that we all know and love, kobolds. One of the few monsters who have appeared in every edition since the first one, Kobolds, in layman's terms, are short reptilian humanoids that usually stand around two to three feet tall with scaly skin, slitted eyes, and three toed hind legs. Tiny horns often jut from their heads and their tails, and their teeth often pokes outside their jaws similar to a crocodile. Baselore claims that kobold skin usually ranges from black to red to brown or even orange, but I personally like to give them the same run of the spectrum as the dragons they descend from. Kobolds also speak draconic, but in their own specific dialect known as yip yak, which carries a high pitched yipping sound to it. Kobolds have dark vision and often live in dark underground mines that they carve out themselves, or thick dense forests, keeping to tribal societies with layers that often fell victim to overcrowding due to their rapid reproduction rate. As such, kobolds had no real concept of privacy and a skewed view of individuality, sleeping in communal areas, having no qualms or embarrassment about nudity, and often fighting each other over ownership of space and items, but not usually to the death. As such, this actually led to a stark lack of deep-rooted divisions and grievances within kobold society, which is a very interesting outcome when you think about it. Kobolds reproduced from eggs and had a monstrously short birth and maturity rate, with kobold females laying their eggs only after two weeks and the egg itself only needing to incubate for two months. Kobolds were able to learn how to walk only hours after hatching and reached full adulthood within six years, living to be around 50 years old if life were a little bit kinder to them. Kobolds, like most reptiles, also shed, doing so almost weekly with constant rubbing to accelerate the process. Newborn kobolds could also be afflicted with the mutation known as being dragon rot, in which their eggs shimmered and speckled with the corresponding dragon's color. Upon birth, the kobold could bear wings that would sometimes be big enough to allow for natural flight, and so these eggs were treated with extremely special care and sometimes taken to special hatching sites in order to incubate safely. Furthermore, a weird fact about kobolds is their propensity to domesticate and use dire weasels as guards, mounts, and hunters, which resulted in the appearance of, and I'm not kidding, lycanthropic kobold dire weasels. Around 1 in 10,000 kobolds was a natural lycanthrope in this manner, and this is a real statistic that I found in my research. In terms of kobold behavior and culture, kobolds focused primarily on the good and support of the tribe, even beyond concern for their own individual lives. Kobolds were also known to serve dragons and worship them as gods, presenting them with tribute and sacrifices that ranged from treasure and gold to live prisoners that they either captured or who were caught in the traps of their lair. They would even go as far as to serve a dragon in secret if the beast didn't accept their service, and consider being eaten by said dragon to be a great personal honor. Kobolds also did not maintain monogamous relationships due to the importance that they placed on propagation, choosing mates based on practical measures and the creation of strong children rather than love and other emotions. Mating for them was extremely impersonal, which leaves their actual emotional spectrum to interpretation. Kobolds were also incredibly xenophobic, not because they thought themselves better than the other races, but rather vice versa. Most people would poke fun at them for their thin frames, short stature, and claims to draconic ancestry. And perhaps this could translate to the pride and arrogance of dragons being shown in kobolds, but regardless, they were perfectly happy to live separate from the other races, and would direct focuses to build and conquer as much as they could, if only to prove themselves to everyone else. This included digging massive industrious mines, laying traps and defenses outside for potential invaders, and cultivating spaces for ambushes and surprise attacks such as murder holes and arrow slits. As per Tucker's Kobolds, which I'm going to link in the description below. A beautiful read, excellent combat advice, definitely check it out. Traditional kobold strategy when faced with an enemy is to prevent direct confrontation as much as possible while still dealing damage, and then overwhelm them with a sheer force of numbers. We'll go a little deeper in that when we cover kobolds in combat, but furthermore, kobolds were also particularly keen to sorcery and artifice, using divination magic to locate ore and mineral deposits when mining, calling upon draconic lineages to aid and fight against nosy adventurers, and creating all manner of inventions in service to the greatest kobold pastime of trap making. Creating jewelry from the ores and gems that they found, as well as art depicting the tribe's history, were also creative avenues that they pursued. While kobolds worshipped most dragons as gods, they did have their own main deity by the name of Cthulhmak, the god of war and mining whose worship focuses on seeking out magical items that may free him from his eternal prison. They also worshipped gods like Gaknalak, god of traps, stealth, and trickery, Dakarnak, the kobold demigod, and a large variety of other deified kobold heroes. In terms of running kobolds in combat, I'll go into a little bit more detail than I had said previously. Kobolds use ambush tactics, traps, and overwhelming numbers to fight their enemies, forcing them into close quarters where they're subject to things like spike pits, chain nets, smoke bombs, and arrow slits. 
Kobolds know their minds extremely well and insert all matter of murder hole, trap door, and secret passageways so as to outmaneuver their foes and lead them in circles. As such, have your kobolds use all of their mobility to engage in skirmishes and bait your players into traps, pelting them with arrows and other forms of damage from places that are just out of reach. Kobold sorcerers and artificers can add angles of magic and flying attacks, so play around with these ideas when your players decide to disturb a kobold mine. Likewise, kobold artificers can create all manner of inventions, jewelry, and magical items that your players can discover as loot. Now, for Dungeon Masters, here are a few kobold characters and quests and encounters that you guys can use in your games. The first one, and the pun's going to be hilariously obvious, is D. Beers, the kobold gemstone diviner grime lord. D. Beers is a kobold divination wizard who uses his powers to find gemstones, ore veins, and mineral deposits for his tribe's miners to collect. He is intelligent and shrewd and protective of his people and is very aware of the dangers of colonization at the hands of other races that are around them. As such, D has turned his focus from finding any and all precious stones that he can to finding explicitly diamond, as he knows the worth that they hold to other civilizations. Using this, he collects massive diamond hordes and uses them to generate funds for his tribe's artificers to buy materials necessary for him to create powerful constructs to protect the tribe, rather than hiring muscle that could betray and take them over in the future. As I said, kobolds don't really trust anybody. Beers then goes a step further, using these diamonds as incentive for adventurers to come pay tribute to him and his tribe in order to access the diamonds needed to resurrect their dead comrades. And before long, he runs an entire conglomerate of construct-protected miners and a diamond horde that affords them wealth, protection, and resources. D is made to be an intellectual subversion of the kobold stereotype, a businessman and a crime lord who uses his people's mining and building prowess to their advantage. There's nothing funnier than hinting at the party meeting a ruthless, powerful noble or merchant, and then discovering that it's a simple kobold who owns a diamond and construct empire. I personally can't wait to use this character in my games, but, but let me know if you guys have any fun with it. Next, we have Drac, the Kobold Armor Artificer. Always inspired by the majesty and mythology of dragons, the small and physically unimposing Drac worked very hard to scrounge up all materials that he could in order to build his first set of armor, constructed in vain of his draconic inspiration. Over time, however, the suit got larger, starting from a shiny simple breastplate and goggles, to a massive construct body that he can enter and pretend to be other races such as Lizardfolk or Dragonborn. Drac dreams about one day building a dragon construct that allows him to be the legend that inspires him, and thus the party can choose to aid him in his endeavor by gathering materials or even teaching him different ways to build if your party has an artificer. Likewise, the kingdom could call upon adventurers to battle against a shining metallic dragon in the mountains, only for them to discover that it is a massive construct that is piloted by Drac, who is using it to defend his tribe against the invasive forces of the kingdom, who have captured and stolen ore and materials from his own people. For quests, this one is titled The Divine Egg. The party is traveling through a woodland realm and discovers a group of bandits harassing a kobold and trying to steal its egg. After dealing with the bandits, the kobold thanks them but has little to offer beyond some trinkets, but may ask the party if they'd be willing to aid them in transporting the egg to a special site for incubation. The party will discover that the egg is modeled with colors, and an intelligent member can discern that the egg is blessed with the powers of a dragon. Will the party journey through and help the kobold reach the site for the egg, or will they finish the job that the bandits started, steal the egg, and pawn it off as a dragon egg at the local black market? I don't assume that players always play all good or all evil characters, hence why I provide both angles for every quest when I can. And lastly, we have a roleplay encounter that I have titled, Eat Me! Exclamation mark. The party discovers a kobold shouting and praying at a cave that is actually the lair to a slumbering dragon. If the party approaches the kobold, they will reveal themselves to be an exile from a nearby tribe who is keen to redeem himself by earning the greatest honor that their tribe can have, being eaten by a dragon. He is clearly enthusiastic and very sure that this will work, and doesn't really care if it means his own death. So, will the party aid the kobold and try to convince the dragon to devour him, or will they talk the kobold down, bring him back to his tribe, and try to convince them to take him back? It's a very small roleplay encounter that could potentially turn into a full quest if the players find it interesting. Maybe the tribe agrees to take the kobold back if they go and collect a special magic item for him, or maybe the dragon is confused and asks the party why they're trying to get a kobold to feed itself to them. Give it a shot and see what happens. And lastly, for our magic item in this video, we have the Kobold's Multi-Tool, a special little item created by a Kobold artificer used to cover multiple angles of cultural existence. This item is a rod that counts as a plus one all-purpose tool, requires attunement, and can cast the cantrips Mending, Mage Hand, and Blade Ward at will as a bonus action. Additionally, you can use this item to cast the spells Dragon's Breath, Identify, Legend Lore, and Locate Object each once per long rest, but the only stipulation is that the last three can only be cast on things concerning ore, minerals, precious stones, and even magic items. A dwarf would truly love to get their hands on this magic item. The multi-tool is simple, useful for anybody of any class or race in some way, shape, or form, and can be good for finding and learning about magic items or collecting precious stones such as diamonds to resurrect players. I've included the item stat block in the description below. 
So that's Kobolds, everybody. As usual, I want to thank you guys for watching. And if you guys like the video, please like, share, and subscribe, as well as press the little bell icon for future videos. You can also vote on the next video by using the link in the description, choosing between three classic D&D characters. We have Wolfgar of the Companions of the Hall, Strongheart the Paladin and leader of the Valor's Heart, and Kellic the Evil Wizard, leader of the League of Malevolence. Lastly, please let me know how you guys have encountered kobolds in your games and what you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.